Hello and welcome again to the 108 Harvesting CPD Snippets. For some of you are already familiar with this, but for those of you who are not, we are running short seminars for lunchtime uh, sessions in a variety of specialist areas by the team here at 108 Harley Street. Consultants give each a short talk using 12 slides for 20 minutes with the hope that we can cover a single topic and try and make this interesting and relevant and hopefully even entertaining. Please do send us your feedback and recommendations, anything you'd like us to cover, and we'll try and uh, cover that. Uh, each each, talk, each uh, talk will have one or two key slides, this, this little sign will appear in the left hand corner, which is the main take home message. I'm a colorectal surgeon, and today I'm going to talk about rectal bleeding and when to refer. And right at the outset, I will apologize to uh, all our GP colleagues out there who are already doing this in an extremely uh, high standard. Uh, you know quite a lot about this already, but hopefully uh, a bit of refreshing course, maybe one or two snippets that are maybe new to you. Um, rectal bleeding, as we all know, extremely common problem and in those patients who have a potential pathology with bleeding, the vast majority will be benign disease. Sorry. However, 10% are malignant conditions, and we need to have a system to recognize these and refer them appropriately for prompt investigation and diagnosis and treatment. However, just because they are not malignant conditions, a benign condition such as this over here shouldn't be ignored and we need to manage those conditions too. This, this poor chap has got pretty horrible hemorrhoids as you can see, they bleed on a daily basis, they're very sore, they prolapse and he had excellent results from simple surgery. As did this chap who although it looks a bit like it's a, a nasty cancerous looking growth, it's just simple anal warts. But they're quite large and as you can obviously see they, it bleeds, it will become itchy and who can tell me that they can keep that anus clean. So patients don't like it because they can't clean themselves. So again it's easily managed surgically and a benign condition. So this is a study, uh, this is a talk, uh, sorry, a paper that showed that there is an obvious iceberg of uh, symptom, iceberg as far as rectal bleeding is concerned and that in a normal population there's a large proportion of patients who have symptoms that don't necessarily even present. So there's 6,000 questionnaires were sent to individuals and uh, they had a report, itself reported 709, that's 18% rectal bleeding. Not uh, surprisingly, a significant proportion, a third of them was in the fifth decade of life. What's more interesting is that only out of those 709, 28% report themselves to the GP and present themselves with rectal bleeding. Of whom, uh, as you would expect, about a quarter were referred to a specialist. So, the majority of uh, these can be dealt with by a general practitioner and very adequately and very well. But the concern is that a significant proportion are not presenting, and we'll come to that again later. And of course, this is the thing we're worried about. This is an MRI scan uh, or a single image of uh, in a man. Uh, you can see it's an, uh, it's an axial scan. This is the pelvic acetabulum, the, the two femoral heads, bladder at the front, prostate there, and this is the rectum with the mesorectal fascia, which is this membrane, of fatty membrane that surrounds it. As you can see in here, it's this normal fat, but here you've got this horrible high, low, uh, uh, in low signal area, which is a cancer. And this is invading all the way back towards the coccyx and sacrum. This is a really nasty, uh, locally advanced rectal cancer in a youngish, uh, early 50 year old man. Um, a lovely paper from The Lancet, which was uh, 35, 4 years ago, 35 years ago, looking at how good are we in predicting the site and source of bleeding. And look at 16 patients uh, with cancers, proven cancers. and based on their symptoms of the bleeding, a description of the bleeding only, it was it showed that general practitioners were able to uh, determine cancer with a positive predictive value of 21% as a source of the bleeding and rectum and colon as a third. 
and even gastroenterologists who are supposed to be the specialists could only pinpoint the positive predictive value was 34 percent so a significant portion weren't able to just predict the uh, the, uh, the cause of the uh, bleed as cancer being the source by symptoms alone and each each group a, a proportion of cancers would have been missed if they literally only listened to the symptoms. So symptoms are not easy, and just because patients got uh, bleeding, uh, it's not enough. You need to have some other way of uh, determining who gets referred. And it's uh, if you look at this uh, picture on the left side, it doesn't. It um, it's not surprising that there were uh, such poor pickup rates. About. Uh, I would suggest these are a little bit over-exaggerated, but certainly 30% or so of colorectal cancer occurs in the rectum all the way to rectal sigmoid, and about another 20-30% in the sigmoid colon. So, and if you add those up, a significant proportion could present with fresh bleeding. These are within the range where a patient may present with a fresh rectal bleeding. And uh, if they do so, you could easily, in a young person, assume that it's bleeding and in fact patients just assume it's bleeding from hemorrhoids or simple problems and that's the problem a proportion of these patients present as fresh rectal bleeding and as you can see from the statistics 10 to 15 percent of rectal cancers are within the reach of a rectal uh, a finger uh, depending on the length of the finger i guess 10 or 15 so if you've got a longer one you pick up the higher rectal ones with a bit of a pressure um, 30% within the reach of rigid sigmoidoscope. So it is well worthwhile referring these people for just a simple sigmoidoscopy because if they've got fresh bleeding and can get to the rectal sigmoid junction of the rigid sigmoidoscope, then at least there's a level of reassurance. But you can see why uh, pickup rates and predicting where the source of the bleed is uh, from or, or what it's from by simply listening to a patient's history of rectal bleeding is very difficult. So many years ago and decades ago, in fact, people started looking at different types of bleeding. It's not enough just to say fresh bleed or not. And they started categorizing this as outlet bleeding, suspicious bleeding and hemorrhage. These are not new to you. I apologize because you're already doing this every day. You're making these algorithms and decisions in your head. But um, just as a uh, sort of the, uh, to refresh ourselves, uh, outlet bleeding is bright red blood on paper in a bowl. And in, crucially, it's in absence of any family history or any change in bowel habit. Suspicious bleeding is any bleeding which has got family history of cancer or a change in bowel habit associated with it. And it's any dark blood or blood mixing or even blood streaked in the stool. So beware of the streaking blood on the stool. It could be a hemorrhoid or a fissure that's streaking on top, but it could also be a big polyp or a cancer that's sitting in the rectum uh, unbeknownst to the patient and, and or ourselves. And of course, hemorrhage, a heavy bleeding requiring transfusion, etc., hospital admission. So let's have a look at this study then. Is this type of categorization of rectal bleeding any help to us? Can we tell what's causing the bleeding if we listen to, if we categorize it outlet bleed? Well, here's a study in a disease in colon and rectum from 1991. And again, if you look at the positive predictive value for left sided cancer, that's cancers occurring below the, the splenic flexure, sort of descending colon, sigmoid, and rectum, it's only 34%. And it is utterly useless at determining outlet bleeding for anyone who's got a predictive cancer of, of, of uh, uh, right sided cancer. You can exclude a right sided cancer pretty much but you cannot exclude a third or so of uh, people with uh, left side of cancer. So outlet bleeding is not good, uh, not a great definition on its own. And as you can see here, five colitis would miss, diverticulitis, adenomas, and a number of cancers. Obviously, uh, suspicious bleeding is better at picking up the cancers. And even in hemorrhage, which usually they expect to be just simple diverticular disease or telangiectasia, there's a few who present with high heavy bleeding carcinomas. So again, just thinking of it as different types of bleeding is not that helpful. And here's a key slide. This is the problem. Uh, you have uh, the colorectal cancer can present with fresh blood can present as an outlet bleeding. This is a true case, one of my cases. Uh, four or five years ago, I saw this 
healthy young lady, 34 year old, 35, when I first met her, and American lady who's a, a CEO of a very well respected company in, in the city. She presented me with some bleeding bright red blood for a few months, uh, on and off, intermittent, uh, typically from her hemorrhoids, as she put it. She had some uh, hemorrhoids following her child, uh, following her pregnancy and childbirth, and she assumed that was it. When I put my finger inside and had a look with the rigid microscope, I saw this little thing. It's only about uh, uh, it's only about a uh, centimeter or so in uh, diameter, and I thought this looked a bit funny. So I colonoscoped her, I MRI'd her, I CT scanned her, nothing wrong, and I decided I remove this at surgery under general anaesthetic and do a, what's called a, a transanal full thickness excision, as you can see, with a nice margin of normal tissue. And the pathology came back as a T1 cancer, adenocarcinoma, age 34 or five. So that's a curative resection, purely because she was um, educated and aware that bleeding is not a good thing if it persists, even though she's young, even though it's bright red blood. So colorectal cancer, we know this data, but it's a key slide in that we know it's 40,000 new cases each year, although it's probably slowing down. It increased over the last two decades, now slowing down. Fourth commonest cancer, but second commonest cause of death. And crucially, it can happen at any age. If you, however, look at the statistics, 93%, vast majority, are elder uh, or are over the age of 50, and 60% are over 70, which gives you already about a 30 odd percent uh, who are. Um, happening in that age 50s upwards. So don't forget the 50 year olds. These are a significant group. What's worrying is the 7% under 50 year olds, two and a half thousand new cases a year. And there's a very steep uh, rise, although they're still rare in those age group, steep rise in amongst the 20 to 30, 40 year olds in UK and America. And this is probably lifestyle, more sedentary, bad habits, bad diet and obesity probably in the US. Worst of all is this horrible line in here, 50% more or more of cholera cancer under 50 year olds is symptomatic, i.e. these patients have symptoms, they are ignoring their symptoms. And this is that group of that in that uh, sort of um, uh, iceberg of symptoms who do not present to their GPs. And these are typically young people with aggressive tumours. Luckily, the five year survival has improved over the last uh, 40 years, uh, over the last 40 years or so from significantly from 40 percent and 58 percent. But this is probably due to the improvement in radiotherapy, chemotherapy and surgical techniques in rectal cancer treatment and not colonic cancer. So rectal cancer treatment has improved significantly. Colonic cancer is still lagging behind, but it is catching up, improving. So. Um, Bleeding alone is not enough. We've seen it. Outlet bleed, suspicious bleed, heavy bleed, none of these really give us enough indication. But other areas do. Other, other, uh, we have other hints and clues. And again, these are things you do every day in your own heads. You work these out, these algorithms, and you know who to refer. But if you looked at the lifetime risk, for example, of bowel cancer, anyone at age 50 or so, it's one in 16, one in 17 human beings will have a bowel cancer, um, uh, slightly more so in men than women. But if you then add a little first degree relative of any age, that reduces, that increases the risk to about one in six, that's two and a half times more risk. And if you have one first degree and one second degree relative, that increases it. And there's the horrible thing of having a first degree relative that's less than 50 year old. Suddenly you've tripled your risk of bowel cancer or quadrupled it. One in three chance. And um, the point being that we want to pick it up, this lovely little, well, not nice, lovely, but this polyp stage. We want to see these nice stalks and things. They are non-invasive. And uh, we know if, leave these, if you leave these alone, they become the cancer. So, adenoma carcinoma sequence, polyp to cancer sequence. We don't want this guy, it's a low rectal cancer, he's had an abdominal perineal excision, permanent colostomy. We want these guys when you can snip them off and they're cured. So another key slide here, rather than thinking of necessarily which bleeding, which symptom, let's think of who to, as when we think of who to refer, as high risk individuals and high risk combination of symptoms. And the high risk individuals we've already discussed, age over 45. Now, 50 seems to be the cutoff. And in UK, currently, the 
screening is being decreased from initially 64, 65 year olds down to 60 year olds. They're trying to reduce it, but it's still unfortunately missing the boat on a number of individuals. In US, where they probably got it right, uh, they are considering screening for 45 year olds, even talking about reducing it to age 40 for screening. So we should be thinking about any bleeding in a 45 plus, it should ought to be at least referred or investigated. Add to that a family history, suddenly you've got a high risk individual. Other obviously high risk conditions, so osteocarditis, Crohn's disease, um, uh, these are all risk factors for colorectal cancer, and obviously polyposis conditions are uh, go without saying. Past history of polyps, cancers, Female reproductive cancer, breast cancer, these are potential increased risk of colorectal cancer. So you now then start thinking of categorizing these individuals as high risk. And again, you do this every day. You will send a patient who is in their 50s, who has a family history. They are of high risk. So ever, even a spot of bright red blood or a spot of blood on, noticed on the streaking on the stool should be considered as high risk. High risk combinations, we already know this. This is the two week uh, weight uh, sort of categories where patients who have rectal bleeding with a change in bowel habit are considered as high risk, whatever age group they fall into. Rectal bleeding without anal symptoms. If you cannot find a diagnosis, you can't see a hemorrhoid or a fissure and there's blood, it doesn't matter if it's fresh or not. It potentially could be serious. But at least they need to have the rectum and the sigmoid colon or rectum looked at. Changing bowel habit to loose frequent stools for many for a few weeks. We know that. Obviously, anemia, obviously a palpable mass or symptoms of intestinal obstruction. So uh, these are the categories which we want to uh, uh, this combination of symptoms we want to refer and the high risk individuals we want to not ignore. And the gold standard ideal investigation is colonoscopy and it has to be done by somebody who is competent. Uh, nowadays, we are all audited by the Joint Advisory Group based on their standards, or, uh, uh, which are key performance indicators such as uh, intubation rate has to be more than 90. Actually, I would say it needs to be more than 95% really this day and age, and uh, low perforation rates. Uh, polyp detection rates now being we are being audited on 25-30% is considered as average. You need to be detecting one in three of the colonoscopies, you need to detect a polyp to suggest that you're good enough, you're not missing polyps. So we are being audited and this is carefully being audited and uh, uh, colonoscopy is being uh, looked at very closely in the last 10 years. Uh, but there are missed polyps, missed cancers. So final slide, and uh, hopefully you've taken one or two little uh, points on, on board. Uh, majority of rectal bleeding is probably due to benign, co benign causes, but the ones we want to pick up are the ones that are not. Age and family history, of course, are risk factors. And we must remember that colorectal cancer is rising amongst the young, although all still a very small proportion. Nevertheless, a young person with a cancer, uh, there is a significant uh, 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 what um, concerns attached with missing these. Don't ignore persistent recurrent bleeding, even if it's an outlet bleed. I had a young doctor, female uh, A&E registrar, who had symptoms for six to eight months, bright red blood, kept coming going, and no real other symptoms whatsoever, and she assumed this was from a hemorrhoid and eventually came to see me because they were not stopping and said, can you see what you can do with the hemorrhoids? A quick digital examination and sigmoidoscopy, a large tumor, turns out to be a squamous cell carcinoma of the rectum, uh, probably arising from an rectal junction and going upwards. And she ended up having chemotherapy, radiotherapy. We had to do ovarian uh, sampling to make sure she doesn't, she remains fertile and things. So it's a horrible scenario in a young female who's actually a doctor and she actually had anemia of 100 by the time she presented to me. Uh, it can come up, creep up on you and without knowing it. So patients coming to you with persistent recurrent symptoms, we do want to know about. Uh, refer them for rigid schematosmia at a minimum, especially the ones who are bright red bleeding and you know it's easy, quick and we can tell things are not of concern. Obviously keep a hidden index of suspicion 
for those who are uh, uh, to, in order to not miss the serious problems. I hope this was useful and thank you very much.